Um, we're just going to take you through um, a handful of projects that probably have led up to this one in various ways and then just go into the process of putting together this project here a little more. Um, so both Robbie and I are actually trained as architects and Thought Barn does building design and public art and furniture and we've always been involved in all of those pieces and as we've evolved our practice we found that public art serves this very particular um, set of interests that we have and really complements our building design practice and we get to do things and test things in different ways to how we do when we, when we design buildings. So we're going to focus probably more on the public artwork that we've done before um, and how it's ended up getting us to this project. So the, and we thought when we were thinking about the, you know, the pieces that have come together in this project and where it all started, we went right back to the very first project that we worked <laughs> on together, which was 10 years ago in rural Alabama. If you go to the okay. next, next slide. So, I think the, the things that we really get to do through the public art process that interest us is this idea of designing and building within a project. It's also about one of the things that interests us is experimenting with low cost materials and different fabrication technologies and doing unexpected things with everyday materials and also the collaborative building process. And when I go back to where we met, which was in rural Alabama at a really interesting program called the Rural Studio. Um, it's an architecture program related to Auburn University and it's basically a bunch of architecture students out in the middle of nowhere who design and build houses and churches and baseball fields and all sorts of things um, with and for the communities in that area. So I was there as an outreach student which is a program they have for students that aren't from Auburn University. I did it just after my undergrad and Robbie was there as an artist in residence with a local art gallery and informally involved in the rural studio project. So um, together we ended up building, if you go to the next slide, a um, screened porch addition to a mobile home. Um, it was a 500 square foot project, it cost $5,000 and um, was for me the sort of start of a love affair working in this kind of way and I think when we look at this project it has a lot of these elements that still interest us today. So we built, we built it in, an area, in a town called Greensboro of 2,000 people, um, if you go to the next slide, we built it in an area called Depot Street, if you go to the next slide, um, we built it for a lady called Ola Mae Warren on the left and her grandson Taiwan and we got to know her through her brother Amos, who was the sort of patriarchal figure in the neighborhood where we were living and working, and it was on his property. If you go to the next slide. So we built the project ourselves. We we're out there sweating in the, the, the wind and the sun every day. We had a lot of help on the project, and that was from both so-called unskilled people and from skilled people. So if you go to the next slide. We had um, Ola May's nephew worked with us a lot, her granddaughter, the kids who lived across the road. Um, also Bill, who was one of the regulars at the restaurant that I worked at, and Garth, who was a, on the um, right, it was a fellow outreach student. All sorts of people pitched in at different moments to make this little project come together. And we also used a lot of very low cost materials and tried to use them in interesting ways. So the first thing we did was build it on an old trailer chassis which was on the site and that helped us save a lot of money on foundations and we had the idea that if her trailer ever moved she would be able to take the porch with her too. Um, although I don't, trailers don't move very often once they've, once they've found their home. We built it almost exclusively with two by fours built from, uh, bought from the local hardware store. You can see the framing here and in the next slide, some details of that really simple double column details. If you go to the next slide. And then we did just some simple moves. We spray painted the insect screen to get different colors. We actually, we used just normal corrugated roofing material. And then everywhere there was a rafter, we put a strip of transparent, um, corrugated plastic just to create this kind of stripey effect that you see 
we reused some shutters from an old plantation home and simple two by twos. So, and so, as I said, which we were student laborers, so there wasn't any labor costs, but it was built for under five thousand dollars. And was a, it was the first time I'd built anything, and it was a really amazing experience. So um, that's it. No. So fast forward, I think four years. Yeah, four years. So. Um, in 2007, it, it seems like some of that text is not showing up. Uh, myself, uh, Jack Sanders, uh, who's a, a really good friend, Butch Anthony, um, were commissioned uh, by Arlington, Virginia uh, to uh, do CO2 LED. Uh, we were uh, asked to respond to Arlington's Fresh Air Initiative, in which they were trying to get individuals to think about um, CO2 carbon emissions. Um, so what we imagined was an installation that would kind of encompass um, a small traffic island that was right next to Nancy Holt's, um, I forget. Dark Star Park. Right Thank next you. to Dark Star Park. Um, <laughs> so if anyone's familiar with Arlington, uh, that's kind of where we uh, positioned our piece. Uh, the piece was um, a, it was a field condition, so it was basically um, a lot of uh, rebar um, that varied in length from 5 feet to 14 feet. Uh, the topography dropped about 10 feet. Uh, we used uh, LED lights on the end of, of each pole, um, and those were all powered by a local solar panel that um, occurred at the, the top of the site. So the effect really was um, this really kind of nice, uh, floating landscape of, of light. Could you go back one? Um, um, another thing I forgot to mention was we worked with uh, the local um, uh, employees of Arlington County to collect all of their uh, water bottles throughout the, the three weeks that we're there fabricating it. And so on the top of each of the LED lights, uh, you'll see uh, these water bottles. One more. And so you can kind of see. Our, our, the idea was to try to use a, a really kind of banal piece of everyday um, you know, consumption, more or less, and try to imagine how it could be, how you could kind of see it more as a lantern. Um, next slide. Um, this is another uh, early public art project that we did. This is located in Austin, Texas. It's called uh, the Lance Armstrong Bikeway. Uh, we were commissioned. Uh, this is a permanent piece, and we were commissioned to do um, the integrated artwork for a, uh, a bike trail that runs uh, through the east-west corridor of downtown Austin. So um, I'm sure some of you might be familiar with the yellow bracelet, um, which was developed by Milkshake Media, uh, which is also based in Austin. So we kind of used that as an inspirational um, kind of springboard to imagine how um, this yellow loop kind of happens throughout the city, um, and and we imagine how that could, you know, realize itself through tunnels, um, bollards, and benches. We worked with the local city of Austin to reuse um, stop signs they were throwing away, and those became um, the main kind of the plates for um, the bollard. So, keep going. Um, yeah, and then this this is the last in the series of early ones we're going to show. Again, just a, um, this one we just called foil, which is exactly what it was. <laughs> it was a, a, these temporary gateways for an arts festival in downtown Austin, and everything had to be put up and taken down in four hours, based on how much they, time they had once the street got closed off. So um, we used scaps. We got uh, the city of Austin to put up scaffolds, and then we brought in these panels, which were prepared in our studio in the previous weeks. Uh, something called cattle panel, just a fencing material that we attached this radiant heat barrier foil, which in Texas typically gets used in attics. It's hidden out of view. You put it in your attic to reflect the heat of the sun back out of the attic. So there was an idea about taking it out of the attic and putting it on display and we just attached them along the top so that they fluttered in the wind and caught the sun in different ways during the day and basically just marked the entrance to the festival and went up in four hours and then two days later came down in, in four hours. That's a 
a picture of it at night. So th those were the uh, early projects, I would say. And, um, and then in the, in the last year, the projects that we've done have started to go in an interesting direction, I think, where we've been commissioned by either nonprofits or city agents who are looking at the city on a larger scale and thinking about the development of the area and the direction they want it to go in and then plugging public art into that as a small catalytic piece of it. So, and I think Brown Center definitely falls into that category. And so did this project, which we did last year in Tacoma, Washington. Um, and the yellow line you're seeing in the image is the line of an old railroad that was called the Prairie Line. And it runs through downtown Tacoma. I think it was, it was actually the terminus of the first, transcontin first northern transcontinental railroad. And it was the reason that Tacoma came to be in the 18-something or other. Um, all these cities up and down the west coast were fighting over who was going to be the terminus of Tacoma 1 for various reasons. And actually that bend that you can see to the left was where on their deadline they decided to experiment with the line of the slope they were able to take and make it steeper to reach the water more quickly before their federal land run, ran out. Anyway, it's since been abandoned, the rail line doesn't get used, and now Tacoma is thinking about how to turn that into a hike and bike trail through downtown to use, to use it to start to revitalize and bring pedestrian traffic to downtown. And then on top of that, how public art can be a piece of that. Tell that story and um, sort of expand the, the way the area is used. So this is an example of what it looks like now. It kind of has this lovely, poetic, slightly overgrown quality, which we were really attracted to. I think the next slide is a, that's the, that's the rail line that you can see running from the East Coast <laughs> through, through Chicago and over to Tacoma. Um, and then the next slide is, okay, so when we, we did a side trip to Tacoma and there was a, people there are very invested in the history of that line and it's all but disappeared now. In general, people don't know that story, don't know the reason that Tacoma came to be, and there was a lot of investment in retelling this story somehow through public art. So one of the first questions we asked was, well, why, is it called the pra why was it called the Prairie Line? We knew that Tacoma had originally been forest. So we did a little research into it, and we found that at one time, there had been these vast acres of Washington Prairie that the rail line had come across before it reached Tacoma. 160,000 acres of prairie that was highly managed by the Native Americans for, for food and hunting. Since then, almost all of that prairie has disappeared. I think there's, and there's two spots that the public can still visit it. So some exists on private land, and then there's just two spots where you can still visit it. The rest has either been taken over by forest or been built over by development. So on one of our trips there, we went to see one of these areas. It's called the Mima or the Mima Mounds. And it's this really curious area. It has these funny mound shapes that is very contested about how those came to be. There's, theories that involve earthquakes and theories that involve giant gophers and <laughs> theories that involve all sorts of things. No, no one can quite decide, but they've got a very sort of poetic and magical quality. And we thought it was interesting that Tacoma is going to call their new trail through the city the Prairie Line Trail, and yet there's this lost memory of the prairie. So we started developing these ideas about bringing a piece of prairie into the city and both connecting the region to the city and the sort of history of that landscape to the present and its future as a new landscape element through the city. You go to the next slide. So we started developing this idea of literally lifting a piece of prairie and putting it on the line. And, and part of, let me backtrack a little bit, this Our Public Art project was gonna be a, a demonstration project about the role that public art could be could play, but before any work was done on the trail. So part of the agenda was to start marking that trail and bringing people's attention to it. So 
we started developing this idea about building an artificial prairie along the trail that would cause people to ask questions and also act as a marker. And um, we we're thinking about making this undulating landscape and then some kind of grass, grassy something or other on the top. And we went through various iterations. If you go to the next slides of whether that would be literally mounds or a linear piece, if you go to the next one that went down, down the rail lines. So we had the concept approved and then we had to figure out how we were gonna make this piece of artificial prairie. And so, um, I guess the next slide. And I guess we have an in-house laser cutter, so it's kind of a smaller scale. Um, it's about 18 by 32, so we decided that we were gonna make pretty much a small little house on our 18 by 32 laser cutter, which is kind of a daunting task. But um, So these are some early prototypical models looking at assembly systems. Um, Lucy, I guess, touched on that we were kind of going after a prairie effect with the grasses. So we started exploring the longest length of zip tie that you could get um, that would be self-supporting. Um, so these are the early kind of prototypes of that mix um, And so we found the longest length of zip tie that you can get. Um, is that right, Ron? You guys want to, we can talk about that later. I don't know if I'm going to tell you about it now. But, um, Anyway, and we used a very simple kind of tempered hardboard called masonite, also a mucor board or, um, that we could cut on our machine. Uh, next slide. And so we kind of went into the process of prefabricating this assembly um, and making it in Austin. And the, the premise was that much like, kind of very much like what we're doing here, um, we were, we're trying to use complex kind of um, <coughs> geometrical fabrication methodologies, but also make them very attainable to kind of larger audiences to allow you know, volunteer work or kind of non-skilled labor or to kind of invest and, and be a part of the, the assembly process. So this was um, kind of us really creating this uh, in Austin. It's their two laminated eighth inch um, masonite ribs. Um, next slide. Um, we also worked with um, some computer algorithms in, in which we took samplings of the, um, the, the mime amount the kind of uh, color sequence that we found. And we were going to use that color sequence to really program out the individual zip ties um, throughout the entire uh, installation. So here is kind of how the, the color gradient kind of uh, pretty much distributed itself throughout the installation. Um, next slide. Um, so we put that in a big crate, uh, put it on a plane, and showed up in St. Louis. Um, and Tacoma. Tacoma. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> now we're in that one. But, um, and that, these are kind of the pieces unpacked. Um, next slide. And so we kind of had th a three to four day workshop with um, SOTA, which is a school of the arts, it was a high school program there. And um, we kind of had all the instructions and invited students to come uh, work with us for, for three to four days. And they kind of assembled the, the pre-made pieces and they also um, helped us kind of uh, install the, the zip ties as well. So this was the resulting effect. Um, some might call it a hairy caterpillar. <laughs> some might call it an undulating landscape. But, uh, I don't know what we call it, but uh, it, it turned out really nice. And um, after the project's uh, lifespan was for about um, five weeks. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we donated it to uh, Soda, they had a, a campus, uh, their zoo campus now has the, the furry capital. <laughs> and another interesting piece of it was that um, we ended up working with a local public art training program there. They have a nice, a nice program that um, trains local studio artists who are interested in getting into public art. So it's funded by the city and they go through a workshop process monthly and they end up doing a project as part of the course. 
And so we linked up with them early in the process and made this one sort of, I suppose, the flagship piece of a, um, a series of pieces along the whole trail. Because one of the problems we've had was that this trail was a mile long and we were really interested in getting people to walk the length of it. Because it's not an obvious line at the moment. And at the same time, we knew we didn't have the budget to create something that could expand over a mile. So we ended up tie tying in with them, and they did a series of pieces. So in the end, there was an art walk along those pieces, and 100 people, or however many came, ended up walking that line. And I bring it up because in this photo, you might not be able to see, but on this bridge, um, one of the groups did a piece called The Eyes of Abe. And it might not be clear there, but at these very distinctive Abe Lincoln eyes. And so the prep, the, this transcontinental railroad was Abe's pet project. And so it ended up being kind of poetic in the end that Abe's eyes were looking over the, the prairie at the, um, on his rail line. And then, you want me to yeah, sure. Um, and at the same time that we got the Tacoma Commission, we got a commission in Philadelphia, and it was really fun to develop these projects together because both of them were about cities trying to reinvent this old industrial infrastructure and reinvent it as a recreational use, essentially, for the contemporary city. So in the case of Tacoma, it was this old rail line. In the case of Maniunk in Philadelphia, it was this old canal that, um, it's no longer a working canal. The water actually has some environmental problems and doesn't, also doesn't flow. And it has an old boardwalk along there, but because all the buildings turn, its back, turn their backs to it, it's not very used. So the city's going to invest a bunch of money in turn, into turning it into um, a resource for the area, and they're plugging the public art program into part of that, and again, they're using it as a catalytic process to bring people to the site before they invest any money and to start a conversation about the area. So the brief, again, what's fun about public art is that the brief is very open and you, you know, can really interpret it in the ways that interest you. So when we made a site visit, just from a purely sort of aesthetic point of view, we're very taken by this old infrastructure of pipes and wires and bridges along the canal. And we were also interested in the fact that it runs along a, a main street, but from the main street, you neither see nor hear the water because it's just slightly below eye level and you're slightly removed. So you could really remain unaware that any water was there. So if you go to the next slide, we developed this concept of to bringing together the infrastructure and then wanting to see and hear the water, what we called an escaped infrastructure, the idea of making this sort of network of tubes and pipes that would bring the water up to eye level and then shoot it back into the canal so that you heard the water in a way that you might have done when it was a working canal. Um, so this is an image of what it will hopefully look like from the main street. We kind of, it has a little Loch Ness monster quality which was an interesting discussion when we proposed it because a lot of people were intrigued and then some people found it a bit grotesque and there was an interesting question about whether it was good or bad that the, these tubes over time might stain from the water. It was just a, for us like the beginning of the kind of conversations that we think should happen around it about, in this case, water quality and you know the state of the canal and so on. Yeah, so we were, um, with this project we were challenged not to really fasten into the boardwalk. So we uh, developed a methodology of, of pretty much creating structures that really clamped around the existing bollards. So we um, more or less kind of created a, a rib methodology in which um, the, the profiles of the ribs change um, throughout the kind of sequence of, of the project. So they're, they're coordinating five different um, five different sections of 12 tubes. So 60 tubes in all are connected to um, five uh, basically sump pumps, which are, uh, they pretty much pull water out of the canal. Those uh, pumps are then connected to motion sensors, which are connected to <laughs> the existing bollards. Long story short, when someone walks by, the motion sensors 
the motion sensor is activated and it starts to activate the flow of water through the pipes. So the hope is that um, the flow of water not only aerates the stagnant towpath canal, but it also, um, with it starting and stopping, it'll create kind of a bubble sequence within the tubes um, and the, the green water um, going through clear tubes will kind of be a nice visual effect. Next slide. Um, it's really faint, but uh, this is kind of the, the, I guess, 18 different profiles. Um, next slide. Um, so this is a view from uh, the backside of the project in which you can see that um, located to your car, right or left, depending on where you're sitting, um, are the location of the pumps and then it kind of evacuates through the system. Um, next slide. And um, it, this was also had a, a, a night component as well. So uh, within the, the accumulation of uh, the, the 12 pipes, there'll be LED um, lights that will also kind of illuminate the project. Next slide. <coughs> So we're going, that originally was going to be installed in last September and uh, the city ended up doing work along the boardwalk. So now we're going to be installing it in a month, mm -hmm. right? So, um, we get back from this project and then on to that one. So that brings us finally to St. Louis and um, we, we uh, submitted an application for, for this project, I think last October, and we're really happy, really interested when we were given the, sent the brief, which was about this theater district in St. Louis that neither of us had been to, about all these interesting institutions that were in a really close proximity to each other, and about this new public art program that was about starting to make relationships between those institutions and enliven the public space in, Grand Center. So we're extremely happy to be chosen for the project and we came in November to do an initial site visit. And at that point there were, I think we were given five different possible sites. They were either owned by Grand Center or owned by institutions that were invested in the project. Um, and they were, they included the one that we eventually ended up on, but also the field opposite the Pulitzer, Strauss Park, um, the the slope tilted plain opposite our now site and um, another one oh the old church so it was a pretty open-ended visit but and we met with Kelly and Meredith a lot with Roseanne and with Boo and Olivia and um, and these familiar familiar themes kept coming up about the fact that what what got described as an A to B journey a lot was this typical way of experiencing Grand Center that people would drive in. You can see in dark gray is where all the surface parking lots are in the area that really sort of define a lot of the character of the area. You park your car, go to your appointment or your destination and then leave again. And that there wasn't very many reasons to linger. There's maybe a handful of restaurants, but not very many places that you gather outside. One or two things that have started to happen in Strauss Park and this desire to build on that momentum. So when we got back to Austin after our first trip, we started talking about um, a, a lot of these verbs to do with how the area would be used. Detour and linger and meander and all these ideas that this sort of straight line between your car and your destination would be interrupted. And so then, then um, it sort of evolved naturally this idea that rather than making a sort of object that you looked at, we would make a space that you could somehow inhabit. It would be something that you could explore and spend time in. Maybe it, maybe it would be a, something that could host performances. And then, and at the same time, we were think, talking a lot about different patterns and looking at river patterns and water patterns and kind of these ideas of flows. So a lot of different, different things in the mix. And it's interesting now to think for a while, for a long time, we were looking at the field outside the Pulitzer because we were thinking about pulling people off ground. And, and then eventually when we started putting numbers to the proposal, etc., we just realized that space is so big, it's hard to make something really register. So we moved over to the grandpa 
what's called the grandpa site. And now in retrospect, I think it's a much better fit for the project anyway, that it's really nice to be on brand and to get that vehicle traffic and that foot traffic. And you get, even when we were installing on Sunday, it was really great to have all the people going to the matinee performance of Powell walking past and curious, and then the kids coming out of school at four o'clock each weekday. So I think in terms of it being um, the sort of place that a, a lot of different kinds of people are passing and will um, will witness it, it, it's a good fit. So uh, if you go to the next slide. Um, the concept ended up being about this this piece that would fill that would fill the site and that would have these different ways to walk, not a clear A to B path through it, but these different ways you could meander and walk through it, and then these little pockets that could capture, you know, capture moments that would be moments for pause or reflection or conversation. And if you go to the next slide, we had also in parallel to that been talking about string as a material that we were interested in that it, it could be something reasonably low cost that you could cover a lot of area with and that you could play with in terms of both color and density and thickness of the string and the way it would sort of weave patterns and those kind of things. So eventually, so this evolved at the same time, this idea of, sort of gradients of colors that would look different depending on where you were looking at it from. And if you go to the next slide, and so then these were the images that we presented in December when we um, presented our concept proposal of this sort of scaffolding from which these multicolored strings would be strung and create this essentially a, a sort of pavilion or a maze that you could walk through. <coughs> so there's this one and then um, one looking the other direction from Power Hall. And I think the next one is a... Uh, oh, this idea that when you were within it, you would be able to see the street and people beyond, but depending on the density of string, you would get different, you know, different transparencies through it. And the idea that it would be lit at night too. And we've been really taken with that experience down Grand Boulevard, where you get the different colored neon signs against the various sort of gray buildings. And we like the idea that this would, is its own sort of neon sign that would add sort of play into that landscape. So we, um, and these were the different components that were part of it. This, this scaffold structure, which for a temporary project is great to use because you can, you know, you can get a sort of really sturdy structure up really quickly and down really quickly and you know it's gonna hold, and other people that can build it too. And, uh, and then the idea of these plywood ribs that would be strung from the top and bolted into the bottom that would, you would string, string the string between, string the cord between so that we could control the, control the patterns and densities. So then that got, that got accepted in December. So then in 2012, we've been figuring out how we're actually gonna make this thing. Right, so I guess what you're looking at is uh, pretty much a visual algorithm um, to kind of some of the, the, the processes that we kind of put into the project. And, and what this really helps, the kind of, this is kind of the behind the scenes of how much complexity kind of is in the project and um, how much programming about in terms of kind of the color coding and also the densities. Um, and this was developed within our office to help us kind of regulate and also um, do the color. So basically each of these little moments is a different variable within the installation. So it could be that this one is about what distance the string is apart. And then the next one is about what the thickness of the string is. And then the next one is about what color the string is. So what that allows you to do is test. We, so we had a 3D model of it and that allows you to test a lot of different scenarios, really, rather than if you want to see what the string looks like four inches apart as opposed to six inches apart. If you had to go back and redraw every single one of those thousand strings, you'd be there forever. But in, in this version, you just type in four, or you type in six, and you rebuild the model and look at it. And then it also tells you how much string that is total, so then we would compare that with our budget see if we could afford it, you know. So it's a really great decision-making mechanism. 
Um, and so, as you, maybe go back three slides. Right here. Um, as you can see, so to your far, or to my far left, you can see there are top two, there are a top row or um, plate and then a bottom plate. So those plates vary in their width. Um, and so in the, vari in the varying width, they create um, more or less concave and convex shapes. So the top, the bottom ribs have a smaller kind of footprint and the top ribs have a larger footprint. So if you go back. And so those get all um, kind of issued to four by eight sheets of plywood. Um, we're working with a great fabrication shop in town, Troco Fabrication and Tim Trotter and his team. Um, in which they donated all the, the water jetting of uh, plywood, which seems kind of, um, it doesn't seem like you should do that. <laughs> <laughs> water jet plywood, but um, uh, we, uh, these are kind of the files. So these are the, the, the two dimensional files. So each of those files are kind of, are the, the ribs are broken down, in, down into components in which we will get all those components back next slide. Um, and how the, sorry, just to, for those of you not familiar with the water jet machine, it's a pretty amazing giant machine that holds a four by eight sheet of material, in our case, plywood, and it shoots out a really intense jet of water with an abrasive in it. So that goes up and down that sheet of plywood, cutting out all of those pieces. and pretty fun. So if you, our Facebook page has a link to a video that Tim's shop posted of that machine and process, which is pretty fun to watch. And so it's, it's much like a modern day printer. And so these are kind of the assembly uh, drawings on the, on the bottom are the bottom ribs and then on the top. So you can see how the, the overall shape kind of changes um, in dimension. And so that change in dimension creates that concave or complex kind of walls. And each of those pieces that comes off the machine has a particular label on it that then tells you which segment it belongs to and which position it goes in, which then meant we were able to work with a bunch of people here to put them together as they, as they a kind of system of assembling them once they came off the machine. And then, so we also did the same in terms of setting up an assembly system for the string. So, because we knew we were gonna be, well, both for us and for the people that we were gonna be working with, we needed a system to understand what string went where. So what you see here is um, these slightly complicated diagrams that the Grand Center Arts Academy kids got to grips with really easily that just tells you how many pieces of string and what color go on each rib of each piece. So in this case, there are 10 what we'd call segments in all. Um, this is segment seven. On segment seven, you can tell on the outer rib, you're gonna get eight pieces of a particular green, I think parrot green. And then you're gonna get 16 pieces of spearmint green and then 16 pieces of ocean blue, and so on. So, when, and you'll see in a minute when we worked with all these kids to cut all these pieces of string, they're all very carefully organized into groups that are labeled segment seven, group one of the outer rib, so on and so forth. So in theory, when we get to site, you know, we can organize those groups of string with each segment and put them into place, and it'll create the effect that we were looking at on a screen a couple of months ago. So these have been really useful sort of assembly diagrams to work with and to be able to work with other people here. And then this is a little washed out, but it uh, it's meant to show you what all those segments look like assembled. So next slide. Um, well, this is more or less our prototype uh, that we built in Austin. So as you can see, um, the effect that you get through uh, the diagonal, basically each, we have a whole sequence that are two holes and the whole sequence uh, varies as you go throughout the installation. So um, they vary in the width apart. And so uh, if you run those at a diagonal uh, to each other, it creates um, a nice kind of 
mortaring effect, um, and then with the concavity of the walls, um, you more or less uh, will hopefully get a unique experience, um, depending on your height, depending on the daytime, depending on the, the path that you take through the installation. So no one person should have the same experience as the hope, so next. We also used this to decide which colors we were going to use from the amazing choice we had with this stuff called macrimony cord, which is what we, so it's actually, it's this stuff that's usually used for weaving lawn chairs from, so it's designed to take human weight and to be outside, and it comes in this amazing array of colors, and we ordered them all so that we could, <laughs> we could choose them and then use this process to whittle down which ones we were going to use. <laughs> I didn't take this <laughs> So we got in on Thursday and we had everything sort of lined up basically. And so the first thing that happened, even before we got started, the scaffolding guys got started. So we had sent them drawings ahead of time and they were at work from seven on Thursday morning and got that upgrade. And they were really great working with us to figure out how to really minimize the scaffolding that you could see. So. If you walk behind the wall, you'll see there's a lot of scaffolding on the back of the wall. That's where all the support happens. And we try to minimize it on the front as much as possible. Um, that is us outside the Troco workshop picking up our first batch of ribs. And this is, uh, in the background, you can see the water jet machine in action. So here's the bed and here's the nozzle that shoots out the jet of water. And here's the computer that's feeding, feeding it an amazing amount of information and telling you an amazing amount of information too about how long it's going to take and the speed it's running at and so on. And then another great thing was that Kelly set us up with a space on Olive Street to work out of that I think gets used for scene making. Mm -hmm. And what was really great about that is that we had the scale of our site several times over. So we were able to lay out all of our ribs um, at full scale to put them together. I've got to give props in this photo to Erin Taylor, who's here and also here, who's been a really talented artist and architect, who's been an amazing help to us um, uh, while, while we've been here and um, brings a lot of construction and systems know-how as well as muscle power to the project. So um, uh, that's us laying out the first set of ribs. And then here we are uh, on Friday at Grand Center Arts Academy with, I think we started at eight in the morning and went through six classes, um, starting with eighth grade, then sixth grade, then finishing with seventh grade. And so we, um, and they were turning over each hour. So it was a really quick introduction and a sort of set of instructions how to read those diagrams and then get to work in teams with strings and cutting and those kids totally got it and were totally into it and um, asked really smart questions and made everybody laugh and got 97% of the string cut so it couldn't, we couldn't have asked for better partners in taking, taking care of that. So there's a few, and the interesting thing was to watch them develop systems for all these little pieces of it, just about how to count out the string, how to wrap it once they've done it, you know. They were very competitive with each other about who had better systems, and, um, especially the sixth graders, much more competitive than the eighth graders, racing each other and trying to do it more quickly, but a lot of fun. This, this girl was very precise in how she, so she bundled them really nicely and she had a matching bow, so she was very particular about wanting to do the blue. <laughs> um, and then also, of course, there were, this was a nightmare because as soon as someone discovered that they could plait their hair with it, everybody wanted to plait their hair with it. And, you know, concentration totally waned. Luckily, we were towards the end of the day. But, um, and then here you can see they, they picked up very quickly on this sort of system of coding each bundle that we developed where each bundle has its own mark that tells you what segment it belongs to, whether it's an outer or inner rib, what order in the sequence it goes in, and then how many strings there are in the, in the piece. And then we got to work with um, 
Some really great students on Saturday from Craft Alliance who are part of a program called Crafting a Future, I think. And they really upped the bar because they're kids who've chosen to spend every Saturday of an entire year doing art. So they're already invested in the creative process and familiar with prep work and you know various different kinds of materials. So um, we had them in the workshop on Saturday and they did a bunch of different stuff from um, once each string is cut, it gets the end gets heated to fuse it so it doesn't fray, and then it gets a washer tied on it to stop it pulling through the hole. So there was a bunch of them doing that, including Kenny. Um, Meredith, too, was there helping. And this is, I think people like this process, it's like a very zen process. You know, it's good for chatting and gossiping while you're doing it. And Maya also and Samara have been involved in that. And then we had um, kids helping us sand the ribs down and also paint the ribs, I think is the next picture. So we painted them a gray to try and make them disappear against the scaffolding and the gravel. And then finally on the weekend, we, um, yep, um, we had the dream team. Dream team. <laughs> ben Furman's office uh, help us and also James from Grand Center um, we had the daunting, well, it seemed like a daunting task, but with that much expertise on hand, it became a pretty simple task. And us connecting um, the top ribs to the, the scaffolding, the next one, um, which is pretty much there. Uh, they're connected um, with kind of approved scaffolding um, plates um, that are provided through the scaffolding company. And so we initially, um, hung all the ribs uh, in, I think, about 94 degrees, which I'm used to. But, um, everyone else uh, seems to get used to it um, after a little bit. Next slide. And so that was kind of the result and effect. Uh, you can kind of see some of the, the nice shadows that um, are happening around 1 o'clock or 2 o'clock right now. And we also, on Sunday, installed uh, the Mylar wall uh, with the help of James and Ben again. Um, what was that the same day? Maybe that was the same day. Very productive day. Very productive day. A very productive day. We installed the west-facing Mylar wall at sunset. <laughs> we did. <laughs> at sunset. And we kind of concaved it a little bit to give Ben a little bit more of a <laughs> it's amazing what you can do with Mylar, but um, that was uh, that all came together, and that's kind of the result. And then <laughs> I guess here we are. Uh, yeah. yeah. So we're in the middle of it. We're kind of on track. We're feeling pretty optimistic about getting done by getting done by Friday. We counted yesterday. I think. We've had over 200 hours of volunteer help in five days, so that is a testament to, first of all, the awesome committee sending out their tentacles, and then to the willingness of the creative community in St. Louis, willing to give up their weekends and evenings and classroom time and all that to invest in this. It's really blown us away. Yeah.